Okay, welcome to our <laughs> seminar. This is an historic occasion, Alan Pierce's first seminar at Huey. <laughs> Alan is very well qualified for this, and I would like to present a short, short list of those qualifications. First, he is adjunct scientist in our department. He is also professor of mechanical engineering at Boston University. He is editor-in-chief of the Acoustical Society of America and recipient of the Society's gold medal in 2005. He is the author of this book, Acoustics, An Introduction to Physical Principles and Applications. You may be interested in his academic lineage. His thesis advisor at MIT was Laszlo Tiso, and Philip Morse was on his committee. Alan is a reader of Kingsley Amos and would probably be quoting from Lucky Jim were it not for the charged subject of his seminar today with the revised title, Low Frequency Behavior of Sandy and Muddy Sediments. Okay. Uh, I don't know, is this thing on? Or is something I pushed to feel on? It's okay. It's okay. Okay, anyway, um, you probably can't, um, it's a little darker than it was on my screen. Uh, the, the, this subject uh, is really quite venerable to a lot of people, uh, and I thought that you might, uh, you might know some of the people who have worked on this subject of sandy, muddy sediments. Bill Carey, I believe, is here. Uh, Bill Sigmund is an RPI, and we've been collaborating with him for a long time. Many of you may remember uh, John Collis, uh, who was uh, here for a couple of years as a postdoc. And of course, you know George Frisk, uh, who was here and is, is still comes here in the summer, and is now at Florida Atlantic, and uh, you probably I don't know if you can recognize him, but this is, um, I don't know who this guy is, anyway. Um, <laughs> and you may recognize this guy, and you may recognize that little device. Jason Holmes um, was um, a student, uh, actually he was Bill Carey's student, um, but he spent a lot of time here, and he did experiments on Nantucket Sound. And Richard Evans, who did work with Bill Carey some time ago, I believe he is here also. Uh, anyway, the... Uh, uh, the bottom of the ocean uh, is sediment, and um, you can sort of classify it into two categories. Um, there's um, sand, uh, and silver, sort of, and then there's little bitty things called, which I'll call clay or mud. And um, when you go to whoop, go back, um, when you go to study um, the propagation of sound. It makes a difference what the bo bottom is like. Um, and this is where I live, um, right up here. And we're someplace down here. And uh, this, is, uh, this is Cape Cod, of course. And this is um, down here, I guess, is where um, Jim Lynch and other people play uh, in the summer. Um, and um, anyway, um, I, the, the, there are certain um, little dots that are yellow. And that's most of the dots, that's sand. There's a few dots up here which I claim are gray, that's mud. And it makes a difference. Um, so let me go back. Now, um, um, now here's what I call the holy grail. Uh, what we really want to know about these sediments, we need a reasonably accurate, uh, complete mathematical model. We don't have one. Uh, and we need it based on fundamental physics. A lot of people that say they have this, I question whether it's really fundamental physics. Uh, we'd like to have it something that has only a small number. Um, maybe, I don't know what is small. I've seen people do uh, matching with maybe 50 parameters. I would settle for five. Um, anyway, you would like to, to be able to test your model with experiment. and. Um, you would also uh, be able, like to be able to measure the parameters independently. Now, uh, the, um, 
there's the two types of sediments is mud and sand, but there's one common feature where we're fairly certain that we understand and what's going on, and that is the prediction of the sound speed at very low frequency. Um, and you think of a sediment as comprised of solid, fluid matter, and both of these matters have their own intrinsic density and their own bulk modulus. And there's a uh, the fraction of volume, which is fluid, we call the porosity. And there's a theory which goes back to actually a fellow named Malik, was this sort of a student of uh, Lord Rayleigh. Not really a student, but uh, um, Rayleigh employed him. He went on to, to better things. And uh, A.B. Wood um, picked it up and put it into his book. And he also wrote additional papers. on. The idea is that a sediment has a, sort of an effective bulk modulus, and you just weight the reciprocals by the fraction that's water and the fraction that's solid. And it also has an effective density, which is weighted by the fraction of water and fraction of solid. And um, you, then once you know the bulk modulus, the sound speed squared, the bulk modulus divided by the density. And that's what is known as the Malik Wood equation. Let me go back. Now, um, one of the things which um, uh, Bill Carey and I got interested in was an old paper by uh, actually Wood himself and D.E. Weston. Uh, Weston, many of you may have known because uh, they're both deceased, but Weston was around for quite a while recently. Uh, and they wrote a paper back in 1964, published in Acoustica, which has evolved into the um, European counterpart of JASM. And they found that this velocity of sound in this muddy layer in some Ensworth Harbor, this is somewhere in Britain, um, that it was um, 3% below that of seawater. Now, for sandy sediments, it's higher. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is why you get a lower uh, sound speed in muddy things. And this has to do with the, um, the amount of the matter that is solid. And you take that malloc wood equation and you develop it in sort of a little power series in um, the differences of these ratios with one. And you come up with this little formula. Here's the sound speed of the sediment, the sound speed in the water, the fraction material of the sound, the density in the water, the density, the density in the solid, the density in the water, and the ratio of the two bulk models. Only they're flipped up, subtract off two. Both of these you should ideally be one, um, so the difference would be zero. And if it was all the same, uh, it would be the same as the speed of sound in the water. Well, um, you take uh, their result that the sound speed in the um, mud was 3% less that in the water. You can, you can, and you know these ratios, um, and you can uh, conclude that the density of the, uh, or the fraction of the material in the sediment uh, that is um, solid is 10%. So the porosity is something like 90%. Um, that's, um, but it, it's interesting that a porosity um, um, like this or, or is, gives you a sound speed that is, um, lower than that in water itself. You think maybe the solid would make it stiffer, uh, but there's two effects going in, and at low um, fractions of solid, it actually, the, this, this number turns out to be positive. So. Can, can you think of it as just as a mass loaded liquid? Uh, no. Okay. But because, um, uh, uh, it's squeezy. Uh, uh, that the, uh, the um, I, I, well, maybe you're right. Uh, you may be right that in this limit, uh, this guy has to dominate. Uh, and um, uh, th this is um, this is this is like 2.6. And uh, this number here, um, well, it's not very. It's it's, it's tiny. So. Oh, is the 
is two the maximum? I'm just huh? trying to figure out. Is two the maximum? Sea sediment twice sea water the maximum we can get? Or if you, if you look at that? What the maximum? I mean, if, if you had a different situation where it was greater in sediment, is, is two? Uh, the, the, the two just comes two. out in expansion. That's just a mathematical mm -hmm. artifact. Well, does that set the limit? Can you ever get well, well, yes, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, we, uh, and um, the, and if I, we're going to draw a little plot versus porosity. The sound speed would go down, that comes back up, and eventually you get to be the sound speed in the solid. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay now, the so one other thing I want to talk about, this is really kind of simple, but um, um, you know, you're not supposed to go too much in the math uh, in, a, in a seminar. It, as the answer to the simple question is, why is the porosity of mud so high? Now, if you, you look at sand, for example, you have all these particles. They settle in. They sort of pack together. And when you think about close packing and everything, the porosity should be pretty low, maybe 50%. Now, but mud is different. Um, the, the, its porosity is high, and then the question is why. And so this theory, I'm not sure uh, it's ever been present this context, but um, um, but I call it the, well, actually Bill Carey and I worked this out together, we call it the card house theory, and it's, um, the, and you have to go back to the nature of mud. Uh, now, this, um, you remember we said there's sand and there's clay. Well, the clay particles are itty bitty, so, and they're small, uh, but, they're, but they're not dust, uh, and they're shaped like little platelets. They're roughly one, two, three, four, five, six size hexagon. They have a di diameter that's the order of a micron, and their thickness is about, oh, uh, 20, one twentieth of that. But they're, they're sort of like little plates, uh, really little plates, but much thinner than they are wide. Uh, and that's what uh, mud is made up of. There's different materials. Uh, I thought of kale and I, at the beginning, and now I've, uh, Mike Richardson got a hold of me and said, really, in the mud that he deals with is some other thing called ilonite, but they're all sort of like. Um, this is an actual picture that comes from an old book by a, uh, William Lamb, who was um, a professor at MIT, um, and one time a neighbor of mine. And um, the, uh, this is a micron, this shows you typical plate of um, kaolinite. Now, the funny thing, well, I don't know it's funny, but um, the strange thing about this kaolinite has sort of a st structure, and there's some, um, it comes in layers. One layer they call gibbsite, another they call silica, and, um, and they sort of stack together, but there are not too many layers in it. And, uh, and you see a, a double layer has um, really, really small thickness. And, um, he wrote a book um, with um, Whit Whit Whitman, um, who was also a thing. And um, there's um, lots of minerals in here, but um, the, 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 these um, little crystals, when they form, they have a hard time figuring out what goes where. Uh, and there's, um, there's alumin, uh, and which has a valence of three, and silicon, which has a valence of four. It turns out these things have comparable radii. So uh, uh, you got this phenomenon which occurs uh, fairly regularly in that the wrong atom goes in the right place or, or conversely. And so a silicon atom which should go gets replaced by an um, aluminum uh, atom. And, um, but quantum mechanics doesn't like this. Uh, so that to to um, to get the hydrogen bomb bonding or the chemical bonding to work, uh, it drags an electron out of from the external environment. So the result is that these kaolinite platelets have gained a net negative charge, which is equal to that of one electron. Um, and um, so uh, that's when this one's a substitute, but it occurs a lot, 400 <coughs> times. So the um, uh, so we have this thing of clay part, particles in water. The isomorphous substitution causes a, sort of a distribution here. And then we've got these ions out in the salt water around it. And um, 
uh, the positive ones tend to collect on the two faces. Uh, but the net effect is it has a quadrupole moment per unit area. And because of that, uh, I'm trying to remind you what I'm trying to talk to, this, to sort of convince you. I'm trying to convince you that mud has a very high porosity. And the only way it's going to happen is for these little platelets, which should under gravity just settle down uh, and fill up um, and make, make the course of sediments uh, thinner, is that these platelets tend to repel each other because of these charges. So um, that's um, um, the, the explanation. And so they tend to come together uh, only when an edge talks the face, and that gives you the um, uh, the card house structure. Now, um, Professor Carey and I have been worrying about this for a while. Uh, Bill Sigmund is also interested. He has a student who's pretty smart that's been working on you. You may or may not heard talks um, which uh, he's, uh, uh, he, he's given on this subject. Um, the thing which we're trying to understand now is why mud has a shear model of this and how what it quantitatively is. But um, um, anyway, the um, let's go. Well, um, well, you can sort of check this out to see if this uh, card house theory um, has some sense. You can look at sort of a regular structure of these platelets, uh, and um, you can say the volume is the um, uh, is is equal to the um, uh, the number of platelets times. Um, the, um, the characteristic length of the plate cubed, and um, then you ask, what is the total platelet area? And then you have go x direction, and y direction, and z direction, so you get three times this. And you can then calculate the fraction of the material that is solid, assuming these platelets are lined up in this um, card house structure. And the fraction is three times the thickness of the plate times sort of the characteristic length of the plate. This is um, a little bit back of the envelope, but if you take a typical number of the thickness of the 0.03 microns and you take the typical length of one micron, uh, you get uh, the fraction of the solid is 0.1, and that's um, the same I deduced in the previous uh, slide from the uh, malik wood equation. So anyway, uh, I'm going to move on now to uh, uh, the subject of sandy sediments. And this is um, something, you go to Cusco side me, you'll hear people talking about, they don't agree. It's a huge current controversy. How does the intrinsic attenuation of sound in the sediment vary with frequency, the limit of low frequency? What I mean by low frequency, I mean roughly between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz. Now, there's uh, various theories. The ones that um, uh, I'm most fond of is the one that uh, we published in um, JASA-L a, a couple years ago. And uh, they have been dignified by a subsequent paper, Kevin Williams, um, uh, which um, got passed to Jim Lynch as the Pierce Carey expressions. Uh, and um, this spell. Huh? <laughs> uh, that, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, well, anyway, uh, he uh, Bill takes uh, uh, gets gets upset about this, so maybe it's best I, I misspelled his name here. Down here is spelled correctly. Uh, anyway, um, anyway, you take these equations, and you and lo and behold, you come up with a plane wave attenuation in this medium which goes as a mega squared um, in the limit of low phase. So the, the, freak, the attenuation is supposed to go as, a, as a, a mega squared. This is a different version of the same theory, but it's, um, uh, the, the, it's, there's a little more physics than you see, just two constants. And there's, um, it goes as the difference of the densities of the um, densities of, um, of the solid and the fluid. And it also uh, goes as um, here, uh, have an inverse of the viscosity. And the attenuation 
does go in locally in the mega squared, but the um, uh, this is um, an expression here, uh, and the this is uh, is the same as the fraction of solid, and this is the fraction that's fluid, and um, but it does go um, as a mega squared. Yeah, now, Alan, Alan, uh, what, what are the units you use for attenuation in this? Oh, um, nepers per meter. Mm, okay. Um, that that's that's the natural units to use. Um, okay. um, well, some people not do might not scale it with frequency or wavelengths. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I hope uh, I hope you're not in, in the uh, mega to the first power camp, are you? No, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering. If you <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, uh, if you are, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, this is that that's that square. That's that's the, my job for the rest of the talk. Let's convince you that, um, and, and also, I don't know how, if I get to it, there's an old talk, old paper, um, not a paper, a thesis, um, which comes out of Huey, um, which is totally wrong, and um, I want to get to that. I, I thought that if we're going to insult people, uh, you should insult them on their home turf, so that was um, <laughs> So anyway, um, anyway um, there is a, a, a body of work um, which, um, uh, one of these guys is uh, Zhao, um, I forget his first name, uh, but um, he's down at Georgia Tech, and he, this is the figure he has, and he's taken all the data, and here's a, this is a log log plot, and um, this is a, another, somebody else's unit, dB per meter, but basically it's just a constant times Nepers per meter, and um, the, the plot uh, down here falls along the line which isn't quite f squared. It's certainly more than f to the one half, and it's definitely um, not f to the one. So that's uh, what um, he did. That um, there was a lot of uh, work there, and a lot of other people have uh, done this. And um, this comes from a JASL paper by Holmes, Carey, Deju, and Sigmund. Three of the people's pictures you already see, um, and um, they all have exponents here. They, they tried to fit their data in this lower range here, and uh, they come up with an exponent. And uh, the average is about 1.8. And um, the thing which was kind of strange to us was they never got too well. Here's one guy, good guy, uh, Nobles at um, Texas. He got a 2.0. Um, also, also the uh, Tattersaw, Schistic. But, but most of these guys, um, uh, even Kerry and Evans, they got way down to 1.7. So, um, now in order to sort of assess this, you got to figure out how did they do the measurement. And um, I, I don't think Professor Kerry has seen um, what I'm going to say, so he may disagree. I'm trying to interpret what he and um, Richard Evans did um, in the paper they published uh, in the Journal of Ocean Engineering in 1998. Uh, basically, they uh, uh, had um, measurements of transmission loss versus range. They had the um, the actual data, and then they tried to simulate it with guessed environmental parameters. And they proceed to change the guesses until um, they more or less agree. And so, some of the environmental um, parameters they knew at the beginning, um, and then they kept doing numerical calculations. This is sort of using the Jewish And then they had, but everything had big fluctuations. Uh, and you're never, and you're never going to win. You're not going to get to lie exactly on top of each other. But they um, did um, some, what I call signal processing take, uh, where they um, came up with a couple of numbers, uh, which they tried to uh, get to be the same for both um, uh, uh, sets of, of the simulation and the data, and that's how they came up with their um, measurement. Okay, uh, so um, I'm sort of looking ahead, um, this TL versus ray, they did not use the ray approximation. That, now, uh, we're talking about low friction, I'm going to try to convince you that's bad. Ray approximation is bad. Uh, so it's good they did not use the thing. And, um, but still, you say, why? Is this 1.8, is that right, or is it wrong? Uh, and, uh, and so I say that, that um, the um, results is not all that great. And the clue is that um, 
this attenuation they predicted from the um, thing is 1.8. Uh, that's from the data we showed in that thing. Uh, thing. So, and, and the Achilles heel here is that you must assume a definite physical model if you want to, um, and you have to use the entire environment if you're going to do this kind of matching. And this physical model may not be uh, <coughs> completely correct. Okay, so um, now the, um, uh, some of you may remember John Collis. Uh, he was sort of put into uh, the task of looking at this um, numerically, looking at things that might have been neglected. And um, he sort of confirmed um, that shear, shear waves uh, were important. And, um, and, the, and to say, well, why, how, why would shear waves be important? Well, the, the thing is that if you have a, a wave going in the water column, uh, down here in the bottom you have compression waves, shear waves. The shear waves, because the, the, um, this, the, the wave that's running the water column is moving faster than the shear wave speed in the sediment, maybe going slower than the compression, but it's moving faster, is that you get these, um, these waves going down into the bottom. And um, for the most part, they never come back. So that's the explanation. Now, in a later study, which was just analytical, which I don't have time to think, uh, we came up with um, what uh, formula for what they inferred. What they ideally wanted to infer was the plane wave attenuation coefficient in the sediment. Uh, instead, they inferred that plus another thing which had to do with shear waves. And it had to do with the speed of the shear wave cubed. So um, now, this extra attenuation turns out to be directly proportional to frequency. And um, uh, so uh, the, um, this also goes to the cube of the shear wave speed. Now, um, at very low frequencies, this thing should go, as we said, from the Pierce-Carey, C-A-R-E-Y expression should go with a mega squared, and this goes to mega. So when you get down to really, really low frequencies, this thing dominates. Uh, and um, so that's sort of what explains the 1.8. And now, look down here. Um, this is what sort of theory predicts, uh, something times a mega squared, something times a mega. And if you go to a limited range of frequencies, 100 hertz to 1,000 hertz, it will resemble this uh, uh, mega to the 1.8. Mega is just frequency over 2 pi. Or a two pi kind of frequency. Okay, so anyway, um, you do a little analysis, um, uh, trying to see how you would get that 1.8 power law, uh, and uh, fit, fitting um, that to something which is really um, a linear plus uh, uh, quadratic, and you plug in numbers you know about the bottoms, and you pretend you don't know the sound speed of the shear wave speed in the bottom, and you come up with 200 meters per second. Now, the shear wave speed in the bottom, very difficult to measure, but most people say that's in the right ballpark. Now, I don't know what ballpark you're thinking of, but this is the one that I have to look at every day because as, uh, I, uh, at least I see these lights, I can't, uh, and so, and so the right ballpark, um, so it's 200 meters per second. Uh, uh, does anybody not know it? This is Fenway Park. Um, anyway, so I, I don't have time to go to the derivation of that formula, but uh, uh, here's a little bit of a hint um, that you have to look at modal attenuation, and you find that this, this contribution uh, is the same for every mode. So, um, so you can see that you're going to have um, uh, the shear wave contribution and this is, has to do with the modal function of it. I apologize for not going through this, but it's not. So anyway, this is just a repeat of what I said, that um, uh, the reason for the 1.8 is because um, uh, the geometric 
geoacoustic conversions neglected shear. If you, you put in shear, you put in shear properly, you're going to get, um, um, you're going to infer it's one, it's 2.0. Okay, now, uh, getting to um, uh, the thing that um, um, Tim may be alluded to, um, other people, they didn't do the same type of experiments that Kerry and Evans did, they got something different. Now, here's what we ideally like to do. We like to put a source in the sediment, big sediment, put a bunch of receivers on the line, and we measure um, how the, um, the pressure amplitude or something decays with distance, and we prefer that. You can't do that. Now, uh, so, uh, uh, and that, that's a problem. This, um, but nevertheless, you do think this plane wave attenuation coefficient is some intrinsic material property of the sediment medium. And um, so, uh, <coughs> lots of people have tried to measure this in our um, in the last seven decades. It goes back a long time. Um, and they want to determine the frequency dependent on this alpha. And um, they don't meet these circumstances. They have to do um, some sort of um, uh, um, sneaky experiment where they infer it indirectly. And um, um, if you go back and look at uh, early stuff, this is a 1974 review article by Edwin Hamilton. Um, and Hamilton carried a lot of clout in, the, as best I can understand, the underwater acoustics thing. And he, he was a great compiler of data. He never really uh, said, uh, you know, uh, criticized the data too much. He said, here's some data for, uh, for frequencies between roughly um, 100 and 1,000 hertz. Um, and um, and, and he, he labeled this on this plot as C. Um, so we're going to talk about this data plot C. Okay, now, uh, there's, uh, and you find out where does C come from? Well, Woods Hole, ultimately. Um, and it was a 1966 Bryn Mawr doctoral thesis. It was authored by a fellow named Lee C. Bennett, Jr. I, I suspect that, um, I may be wrong, I'm just guessing. None of you guys ever heard of Bennett? None of you ever met him? Um, but um, nevertheless, uh, probably you know uh, Hers Hersey. Hersey was his thesis advisor. He was here a long time ago, but um, pretty famous guy. Anyway, Bennett uh, was a th doctoral thesis uh, a student at Bryn Mawr, but uh, this is a little murky in the thesis, but he either had a summer job or he had a job at Woods Hole, and, while he, and out, of, out of this, he wrote his doctoral thesis. And, um, and um, his doctoral thesis, and the things is, um, I don't think it's a very good thesis. Now, uh, uh, and it's very hard to read. But um, but I've seen lots of theses so over the years. So so I'm probably uh, too big a bad a cr critic. But um, anyway, um, again, this is what I think Bennett was doing in his thing to get this attenuation of sound. He. Um, had what I would call a two-ray pass model. He had a source in the water column, he had a receiver in the water column, and he, um, uh, and he actually had a, 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 a transient source. Uh, and, um, and, but he, he got a rival that he associated with from here to here. Then another one he thought that went down to the sediment, went down to the basement of the underlying gravel or wherever, the, some hard stuff down here that came back. And um, so we got these two arrivals. Now, uh, the, um, uh, and so he has two pulses. Uh, one is the, uh, from, the, from the interface. The other one is one went down into the sediment, came back. And uh, he got more or less um, distinct uh, pulses separated in time. Now, on the other hand, the frequency content of these pulses was, for the most part, fairly high. But you could um, uh, tra pass it through some narrow band frequency filter, and you look at low frequencies. Now, um, the first thing you start um, worrying about, I mean, uh, maybe I would, uh, is that um, there's a certain uncertainty principle. Uh, 
Heisenberg gets credit for it, but um, you know, it shows up in any sort of thing. There's uncertainty about measuring time differences and frequency differences at the same time, and that the product of those uncertainties is one. Um, both these guys got Nobel Prizes, um, uh, I don't know, but Gabor is associated with this and uh, so forth. Now, so that's the problem. Now, another problem is the ray theory is not sufficiently applicable at low frequencies for a better physical model. And um, this is a little bit of analysis that um, you can think about. It. How <coughs> wide is a ray? Well, you know, rays a little infrequent. You think, well, they're, they're not really that um, narrow. And you can think of, uh, of a two, uh, two, two, two uh, uh, a wavefront and two, two points in the wavefront a distance w apart. And you say, well, how far does this distance have to be that the uh, distances from this wavefront to this point over here differ by a wavelength over 2? If the wavelength is over 2, they'll cancel out. And, um, and you sort of look at um, uh, how you get uh, ray acoustics of, from um, full wave theories, and you've got to have, so I recall, a Fresnel zone. And um, anyway, that, um, and, and if you're, uh, and if this, 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 if you go um, uh, uh, far enough away, it doesn't cancel, it cancels out, uh, it doesn't matter. But, um, uh, but you can sort of say that this is a, sort of a representative how wide the ray would be if this is lambda over 2. And you get this width is the distance of propagation times the wavelength to the 1 half. Now, well, that's, that's fine. The wavelength's uh, small. You're doing fine. But um, in a lot of cases, um, uh, the distance isn't um, all that great compared to the wavelength. And... Um, uh, it may, and if the distance is um, uh, um, large, um, then, then your parent wavelength width is okay. So now you can put in some numbers um, from um, Bennett's um, experiments. You take this is in the middle of 500 hertz, speed of sound 15, about the same as down here and here. Um, the um, the wavelength um, at this would be about three meters. Um, the uh, depth of the sediment, that's this depth, would be about 15 meters. The path length would be about, again, you have to look at his thesis, and this seems to be a represented about a third of a kilometer. And so you come up with a ray width, which is 31 meters, which is about twice the width of the sediment. So um, now you say, well, maybe you may, may have lucked out, but this makes you dubious that Bennett was doing. Now, uh, here's some uh, reason for believing that Bennett was wrong. N okay, now why should I worry about this? The thing is, there's a lot of people, maybe Tim here, um, that I think that the frequency dependence of attenuation goes to the frequency of one power. And that's what Bennett came up with. And, um, but, um, and uh, I didn't mention the guy's name at the Cusco site when I talked about this. And he probably doesn't want to mention the name, but there's a paper recently in Jazz that essentially does the same experiment over again. He also gets the frequency, and he also gets numbers that are on the low side. Now, here's Bennett's numbers for the attenuation at 500 hertz. He gets a 0.03 dB per meter. Now, um, here's what Holmes would say, uh, Holmes and Kerry and uh, their friends. Um, they say a tenth. So this is uh, about three times as high. And you see that um, if you go up to 1,000 hertz, it's like six times as high. Um, so his numbers are on the low side. So, um, so somebody's wrong. It's not just the frequency dependence, but things. So um, another thing which um, you can sort of notice here is that you try to extrapolate these things. They don't quite um, uh, go up to here. So it's... Um, so anyway, that's it. Now, um, anyway, um, here's some, some thoughts why Bennett's uh, wrong. Uh, uh, suppose that ray theory is applicable, but, um, so, but then you have the rays are wider, wider than the width, the, like that's the thing. And then you have both pulses 
propagate partly through the bottom sediments. Uh, and and you sort of, when we're talking before about skin depth, stuff like that, you do have, uh, when a ray hits the bottom, it bounces, hits the interface, it bounces off. But it's actually energy that goes in the bottom. Now, the second pulse is affected less by attenuation in the bottom set. So you originally might have thought because it's, it's spilled over somewhat into the water. And, um, but both pulses are affected comparably by attenuation in the bottom sediment. So the ratio of the energy after passing through this frequency filter um, is going to be higher than what you would be predicted by straight ray theory, assuming the attenuation is only associated with the bottom. Um, okay, uh, so I guess I'm okay. Um, granted that Bennett was really measuring sediment attenuation, he must have measured something. <coughs> okay, uh, now uh, uh, I, I'm sort of opposed to acronyms, but, but better something is a long thing, so I'm more abbreviated BS. Uh, and so, um, so we got, um, anyway, so BS, that's better something, is going to be proportional to the frequency of the one first power. Okay, now, um, anyway, here's the data he has, um, uh, and, uh, and you do see that um, uh, I, I scraped this out. He was, he was actually trying to compare it with um, wood, wood and um, the, the mud paper, and I'm not sure quite thing, but his sediments, we're pretty sure, were sand. Actually, the, the measurements that we think we, he's talking about were um, not too far from here, um, in Buzzards Bay. Um, but then, anyway, um, now, um, anyway, you, you try to say, well, why does Bennett something end up with a, um, uh, a linear frequency dependence to the quad right? He's going to get something. And um, here, a little bit of math, um, which I'm not, I'm not quite sure I can convey this, and I get it late into the talk, but uh, you go solve these problems in later media and you, um, you, you pick up some book like Brokowski or so forth and you, um, and you, or maybe Pecoris's papers and you learn about branch lines uh, doing contour integrals and, um, and you have, um, when you do this integral you're going to have uh, go down a branch cut and so forth. This would be uh, frequency over the uh, sound speed in the second medium. This would be frequency of the sound speed in the first medium. This is a higher sound speed. This one is further down. And of course, the branch cuts go like this. And, you get, and this causality sort of tells you how to do it. And, then, and we have Hankel functions and um, so forth. But anyway, the, um, um, uh, you look at what's in the, uh, what comes out of this um, analysis. And, um, oops, um, and you have, um, Factors like e to the minus omega mu d, uh, they show up pretty easy. And what's um, this mu is just an abbreviation for um, this is the this, this is the um, sound speed in the one medium. This is the sound speed in another medium, and this is the one with the higher s speed, and it's all raised to one half. They're appropriate. And then we got a d would be the sediment layer thicknesses, and um, what you see. In this factor, is you have one omega, not two omegas, and um, so uh, you come up with the um, the idea that the, that the contribution of the branch line integral, um, uh, or, or I call the the Bennett ratio, goes with e to the minus two omega mu d, and um, and then you um, think about this. Well, that's right. Then we'd have Bennett something is a constant times the frequency of one power. So. Uh, you can argue um, that um, if you didn't, I, now I'm a little embarrassed. I should have done all this, and if I didn't, uh, I got detracted to other things. So I haven't really uh, ran through the thing. But um, uh, um, I think there's a reasonable chance somebody did this. <coughs> this is what they can come up for Venice something. This is without any attenuation in either medium at all. That he's going to see that um, apparent attenuation in the bottom, which is going to go three than one thousand. Okay, um, now I'm going to stop. Um, so, uh, so I think there's difficulty in measuring indirect in 
for us. This, um, uh, and uh, they seem to be, again, I not, not, don't want to criticize them at people, but they've ignored in previous literature. And um, also say some published results are not merely wrong, they are grossly wrong. I mean, um, uh, when you have a factor of six or three, that's grossly wrong. Um, and uh, so maybe somebody ought to do it. And um, uh, I don't know uh, what I say. Jerry doesn't have a, uh, a clout with people who, who fund stuff. But um, maybe people should, um, should, should look at the past result of results and the sex offense where they are correct. Um, and because experiments are C, you ought, look, you ought to get up the old data and look at it again. So anyway, I'm, so I'm going to stop and say that um, mention a few more names, um, not all of which are wrong, uh, but um, so um, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Tim, ask a question. Uh, no. I was going to ask, actually, in the middle of the topic, <laughs> were Bennett's, Bennett's numbers warned in Ed Hamilton's draft? He probably was not aware of it. I was wondering, you had the group C. That was Bennett's numbers. Oh, those were Bennett's numbers. That's, what, that's where ha Ham there was very little data on low frequencies. And uh, there's a few other points, scattered points, but the main bulk of data in Hamilton's he loved to collect data and put it in graphs. That was Hamilton okay. was great so at that. You, you indirectly inferred that they were in that figure. They were. I mean, that that was um, that, that that those were Bennett's numbers. Now, uh, how um, Hamilton knew about this rather obscure thesis, I don't know. Um, he gave one talk, in an AGU meeting, and that was it, as far as I know. Um, that was Bennett. Bennett, Bennett. Bennett. Yeah. We should look him up. See what he's doing. Well, I, I looked on the internet. I can't find him. Um, hey, um, he, he's, he's about my age. I mean, that I means he's a young guy. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say something in defense of Bennett. Huh? For a 1966 Renmar dissertation under Brack of Hersey, yeah. which is, means he really did independent work, yeah. it wasn't all that bad. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, well, I, I, I have to say, uh, also defensive, but, uh, not necessary to a credit of the institution in which I currently work, that thesis would have, would have, would have passed um, uh, at BU. <laughs> uh, so. Oh, there's another, yeah. another thing to comment on. Then or now? Huh? Then or now? Now. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. You didn't mention it at all. The variety of the variation of the numbers that are in the ocean yeah. sediment from yeah. place to place. And yeah. All sand is not equal and so on. And so uh, that will explain partially the spread in the data, the difficulty well, this, um, No, what you're saying is somewhat true, but um, what's surprising is that um, this number, I don't know if I can go back. Um, um, well, um, Joe's picture was pretty, pretty uh, tight. You know, uh, Joe's colored yeah. Yeah, the, um, the thing is that um, the sandy sediments are different but they're not all that different. And uh, apparently the, um, I'll go back a little further, um, um, the, um, um, I don't know if I said this, uh, put a number here, I'm now, um, anyway, this K, um, you have to put it in your units, um, or Bill Carey's units. Uh, what Carey would do is he'd divide this by uh, F0, that'd be one kilohertz, and then K would be the attenuation of um, at one kilohertz, and um, that would be independent of the exponent. Uh, and the number that comes out is about, uh, again, there's variations, but I think it's about 0 0.34 uh, dBs per meter. And, and it's amazing how, I uh, you know there's not big variations, not a fact varies at a factor of six, which, um, which is what you'd have for for, for so Bennett. Could, so is that what Joe, did Joe normalize each data uh, set? No, he did not. No, no, he did not. Um, as a matter of fact, um, um, uh, Professor Carey would criticize what he did, because, uh, <laughs> but he just took uh, everything uh, and uh, and he just plotted up 
the dBs per meter they got and the frequency per meter, lots and lots of dots. Uh, and um, and, um, and the, they came from what was it, 34 sites all over the world, Bill? Yeah. Uh, it's astonishing that yeah. they plot as cleanly as they Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Really anyway, um, he's very proud of this. Um, the, the, also, uh, the value at one kilohertz is very similar to what you find. Yeah, and um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I put a, uh, put a circle on this. Is, um, here is um, one kilohertz. Um, yeah. And then you go up the cross over to here. And um, um, anyway, you can't see. I guess I messed up here. But this is um, this this is a point. Okay, this is point two, point three. So this is about three point three four here. So dB. Yes. This is dBs per meter. Yeah. So. Oh, that's. Oh, so minus one would be minus one dB. Right. Ten to the minus one. Uh, these are dBs. You know that 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 yeah. 10 to the minus 1 would be 0 0.1 dB. Right. And this would be 1 dB. And this would be 10 dB per meter. Yeah. But that, that 1 kilohertz value is very close to what you see in the summaries that Stoll has in his book for sediment attenuation. Yeah. Uh, Ken? Yeah, you described uh, an ambition to have reasonably complete fundamental physical mathematical models yeah. for this. And, you know, yeah. What to have you say that's hopeless? Well, you know, you, you have, uh, yeah. uh, you, you like five parameters, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually, you know, given what you're working with, these yeah. microplatelets, with yeah. the greatest size of about two micrometers, yeah, yeah. such properties as bulk modulus yeah. depends on the size. And as you go smaller, bulk modulus actually increases. So there is a dependence there. And uh, on some of these measurements, yeah. I wonder about the actual composition and homogeneity of the bottom itself, that is, the, bottom, the muddy sediments, and uh, well, how um, that can influence. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I've glossed over a lot of tricky things. One is that um, the sediment properties do vary with depth into the sediment. Uh, the thing which varies the most markedly is the sheer modulus. Uh, because um, especially sandy sediments, uh, because the weight of the particles above them makes it harder to shear, and so the deeper you get in the sediment, the harder it is to shear. Um, but um, compressional um, speed doesn't vary um, very near as much. Um, uh, attenuation, um, I think um, uh, we're not really too sure about how it varies. But um, if you go back to the Pierce Carey expression. Anyway, that um, the um, um, that uh, the attenuation um, uh, doesn't uh, should should be f fairly okay. I guess I'm find the um, um, here um, that down here in this formula here. Um, this parameter to beta has to do only with the geometry of the uh, sediment materials. Um, uh, a is the representative size of the, of the sediment materials. This is the speed of sound uh, in the sediment. This is the apparent density, and here's the viscosity. And this has to do with the other things. Now, this, um, um, this, this thing should vary with depth only in, to the extent that um, uh, the porosity varies with depth or the, um, um, uh, well, or the viscosity, but there's, but but you don't see sticking out here a big variation of attenuation with depth. Um, uh, now, this, now again, um, this may be wrong uh, because I think it's right. Uh, but um, are there any other questions? No? Okay, I think well, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just questioning maybe the dependence, the beta dependence on depth there. Uh, you said it depends on the geometry. Right. Well, the geometry may change. That's true. And that's um, influenced by that. Yeah. Yeah. There's also organic material and other junk. That that's true. That that uh, that complicates matters. Um, um, and um, one thing which um, um, I didn't get into with um, mud, um, and um, the. Um, this organic material, that's for gases. 
I'll add them. The gases form bubbles. The bubbles in mud, uh, you think they won't come up. Come with them. Well, uh, somehow these, uh, this is what Bill and I think is currently, is that these little platelets, they, they keep the bubbles from getting together. Little bubbles, but they're there. Uh, they're from the decaying vegetable material. So the speed of sound in uh, muddy sediments is even lower than this because of this um, decayed um, um, organic material. So, okay, yes? So is the attenuation is inversely proportional to the viscosity? Yes. So when in the invisible limit, the attenuation is infinite. Yes. Uh, that, that, that takes a little bit of, of explaining. Um, uh, but um, it is. Um, the, um, the, the reason, well, um, it has to do with boundary layer thicknesses and stuff like that. Um, um, and we get some visits. Um, 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 so it wouldn't work for, like, rocks? It's uh, a different model. Yeah, well, it, if, it, if it's rocks without water, this model is inapplicable. Yes. And um, although it's an interesting problem, but um, I, I still question the business of rocks supposed to have attenuation proportional to frequency. And I question if that's really, really good at low frequency. They may just never go down that far. But, um, but some people you know, automatically assume all attenuation proportional frequency. Um, but it's not causal. Okay, I guess I should, I really, okay. I really should stop. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>